Welcome to the Change Within Podcast. It has been about a month and a half since I've done an episode, but I am glad to be back on a nice trajectory to episode 100. But now we are on episode 76, and I am excited to keep it all going. And nonetheless, we have a very special guest for us today. I want to introduce everybody to Autumn Storm. Autumn, how are you today? I am excellent. It's so exciting to be here. Absolutely. So I wanted to ask you, as I ask all of my guests in this process, is what your childhood was like growing up? Ooh, starting off with the good ones. Um, I grew up in a big family, in a small, um, sort of low-income community, but it was a really diverse community that really valued. I keep using the word community because that was the highest value we had there. Um, I grew up with the kind of neighbors that, you know, you you as a kid will go over and you'll take their trash out um, and they'll bring you dinners and sometimes and everybody kind of looks out for each other. That was a really important element to us of how we sort of survived and grew up. You know, when, when one person makes it, everybody makes it. Um, and that's that's been sort of the core of me. <laughs> Follow-up question to that. So what was the holidays like considering how community oriented your neighborhood was? Were you over a it, lot of other people's houses more than your own? Sometimes there were some years where we're, you know, you're with other family and you do your best to get the whole family in one place, whoever has the biggest place we can all get. Um, and then there were times we just, you don't mean to have a party. You just, a couple people, a couple aunties or, you know, grandma comes over and then suddenly the meal is bigger than we expected. Well, now we need a couple more people. Let's ask the neighbors. And then suddenly it's a thing. So really the holidays last like a week because first, if you made that much food, somebody's going to eat it. <laughs> of course. And also in the sense, if you have leftovers more than the next day, the food mm -hmm. obviously just doesn't feel as good to have, especially if you've had so much of it the first time you've done it. Right. So in that regard, it's always nice to have people as hungry in that case as you are. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of kids in my neighborhood. There's always somebody hungry. Absolutely. So somebody wants food. <laughs> so in the sense of the same uh, like continuity within uh, community itself, how did theater come into your life? And when did you feel like you had talent in it? When did theater come into my life and when did I feel like I had talent in it? It came into my life in junior year of high school. Um, I went to Fairmount Heights High School in PG County, Maryland. It's It was historically the first high school that allowed students of color um, in the area. And so I, like, I pride in that. Um, and we got this new teacher who came on. He was supposed to teach the drama class. And at the time I had signed up for the class because I thought this is going to be cool. I can read things. Um, and he took it so seriously. Like he believed in us to memorize lines and stuff. Um, but beyond that, he would write the plays that we would work on. And he would only give it to us a scene at a time. So it was sort of like living through a reality show where you're wondering, oh gosh, what's gonna happen next? And he would let us pitch in on the ideas and the characters looked like us and sounded like us. And it it led us into theater in a way that, you know, we always thought theater was like lofty Shakespeare and this sort of inaccessible thing. And it made it super relatable and super fun. Um, and my senior year, we did A Raisin in the Sun um, it's a play by Lorraine Hansberry. And I remember the day, I can tell you the day, um, we had a performance. We didn't have a theater. We had a stage in the cafeteria and like a couch, a really busted up couch in one of the other classrooms. <laughs> <laughs> that couch on stage and we did this show. And I remember the day I had this um, really close friend. He was a poet. He was like the soft and shy kid in the class. Um, and he came into his element in that class. And I remember the day, like I saw him on stage and just really living in the role. And I was like, I want to do that. If this art is what helps people come into their own and take up the space that there's worth, I want to do that. Um, and so when think about the question, when do I think I have talent in it? I don't, there, there are days that I still don't know if I have talent in it, but I know I have purpose in it. And I'll say that. I like that. I definitely clarity. have purpose. In that's it. that's a big uh, that's a big statement, and I really admire that. Definitely. So I wanted to also ask you in that regard was kind of like in the transition period for you going into psychology in college. 
Like, yeah. how did that kind of segue for you to get where mm-hmm. you are today? Have you heard of health psychology? Yes, I actually have. It's, I, I hadn't until I took, also my junior year in college, um, a class on health psych, and I ended up sort of specializing in it thereafter, because I love the sort of really practical lessons that I could take to low income communities that like had no idea about this stuff. Um, I learned about like food deserts and things like that. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. It was a whole new world for me. Um, And it was something that could have so much impact. Like remember I said, community was like the core of me. I was like, people need to know these things that I'm learning in this class, Um, which easily melded into theater because theater has always been my form of communication. Um, By trade, I was a playwright first. Um, and so sort of writing these things into scripts so people would learn from it, um, sort of, and this desire to find impact after I graduated turned into what I'm currently pursuing now. So I'm getting my master's in theater and a certificate in nonprofit management. Um, and the nonprofit management piece really comes from the fact that in college, I wanted to be one of those people like you open up your own theater and do that. Um, and I still kind of want to, but I think it's less Never about know. opening up. I don't know. I don't know. I want to open up a theater, but at the same time, I think we don't need more theaters. I think we need the theaters we have to be more effective. And so having yeah. that, yeah, having that nonprofit piece will allow me to fill roles that I can help these already really great theater companies um, that just don't have resources yet thrive and be effective in the best ways. Um, So that psychology piece is still there. It's just now I have to add on something so I can really communicate it the way I want to. I think in also the retrospect of having shows that resonate and have that relatability to people just speaks volumes in itself. And I think generally speaking, even in the mecca of it all in New York City, you get Mm -hmm. your constant hit and misses. And the unfortunate part about that is even when you have quality set of performers, if the story itself doesn't necessarily relate to people in that regard, you do have a lot of waste of talent. And then they're pretty much circulating around the same type of shows that thousands of people audition for. (laughs) You can say that again louder for the people in the back because that's that's 100% correct. Yeah, it's it, it, especially living like within the parameters of it all. Like I've seen a lot with it and you, you really do see so many people with talent within the perspective of just acting in itself. And I think also a big thing is too, is a lot of people like they, they want to cross the boundaries as far as doing theater. They're, they're a little bit more self-conscious as far as how they want to do that at first. And they don't know what that first move is going to be. Yeah, that first move is a big step. And that's where people like me who have training and like fundraising or sort of community outreach, that's where we come in to help these really talented people go. Here's the best first step that you can make. So just kind of like an offset question in that regard, like when you when you really put yourself in the vision of going out there to talk to different groups, yeah. like what's the first type of thing that comes to your mind that makes you want to just uh, hit, hit the ground running with, with people in that? The first thing I think of that makes me want to hit the ground running, oh gosh, there's so many things. <laughs> um. The first thing that comes to my mind that makes me want to hit the ground running is that there. I know now that I have this education, I know there's so many funding opportunities out there that small theater companies and these educational theater programs that are all about helping youth, they usually don't know about them. Government grants, um, opportunities to, you can be funded by other bigger arts organizations and still operate as your own company. Uh, which I didn't learn until this past year. And I thought that was amazing. Um, And that's one of the things that I go, there's smaller theaters that do really great work, especially in DC um, or in sort of urban cities that don't know about these opportunities and are are kind of accidentally missing that. And I just want to go, here's money, help the children. (laughs) So that's one thing. And if I can add the second thing that comes to my mind 
always, um, is the education piece. It's theater is a very, very powerful tool for education, but not just in the sort of way like you put the lessons in the plays. It's about the process. Um, and so what was so impactful for me when I was first encountering theater was that during the process, we had somebody that was guiding us, that was challenging us, that was listening to us. That part of the process that's involved in theater behind the scenes is where the educational piece really can come in. And oftentimes, um, theater practitioners can miss that if they're if they're so worried about that final project, you will you'll miss the process to it. Um, so those those are my big two. Absolutely. And then for the viewers sake, tell them about how you approach directing yourself. This is a fun question because I'm currently in the middle of directing a project. Um, I approach directing with play because I think that's what we come into the arts field to do. And oftentimes what I've learned through my work in psychology is that it's, it's challenging oftentimes for people to approach, whether it's a play text or their own feelings or emotions. Um, so it's easier to help them through that by disguising it as play, by saying, let's just walk into the room and do this improvisational task. Let's throw jokes at each other. Let's throw a ball and catch it or do weird sounds while we stretch. It shapes the mind into thinking anything is possible, which is what we need in a world where it almost can feel impossible a lot of times. Um, and so my approach to directing is to take the same way that as theater practitioners, we want an audience to sort of suspend disbelief. I want to do that in the rehearsal room first. I want us to think anything is possible and then go from there. Yeah, because once you create that sense of shock within the staff of itself, it does yes. come into play with how the audience will possibly react to it as they're witnessing the show. Fingers crossed. That's that's the hope. Yes, I'm speaking from a very optimal uh, point of view on that one. <laughs> but yes. I wanted to ask, now, this is kind of at this point for a question that I typically ask a lot of people, this is kind of like a uh -huh. how it started versus how it's going. And that is the okay. pandemic in itself. So my question mm. to you is based on how the arts industry has been from the beginning stages of the pandemic to the potential sense of progression that we're at now, how has theater shifted for you to be working with so many aspects of the community? has shifted in that it's, I've needed to learn new skills in the way some people needed to learn how to use computers and Zoom, but I already had that. Um, so fun fact, I work in a costume shop, which is why there's so many gorgeous colors around me. Um, and during the pandemic, one of the shows that I worked on, we had to create masks and to make take masks, you had to measure people's faces, but we couldn't do that during COVID. So we literally created 3D replications of people's faces with a 3D printer. Um, and then use those face models to create masks. Um, and it's really, it's challenged me to think outside the box, not only in how I create, but also in how I'm interacting with people because the pandemic affected everybody in different ways. And so the ways that some people took on the pressure from the pandemic or different um, situations that were caused in their life by the pandemic um, changed the way that we engaged with art. And so there's certain plays that we've been looking at for years and years. So we went, this is hilarious. Then now we're like, maybe this is so funny anymore. Um, and I, I'm enjoying that. I am enjoying getting a chance to look at these stories and really critically interrogate them for what kind of messages that we are sending a community that has been hurt and needs, needs some uplifting right now. Um, so a really big swing in my theater has been going from sort of telling heart hitting stories to now trying to find stories that are that are joyful and uplifting and empowering and in a different kind of way. Um, it's a shift we are definitely still navigating. I'm gonna ask you more of a fun question and a twist on this too. Now, just, just, just in the sense of how a lot of programming for TV, you kind of generate for the times that you're in. And that kind of yeah. like reflects through the holidays and everything like that. Do you have a favorite network that you always watch as far as content and programming that you're kind of like, wow, mm -hmm. it kind of speaks to like my heart and stuff like that for what I go through? Oh, Hulu. Okay. But for, but for Shonen Anime. Oh, which show? <laughs> Um, okay, currently I'm watching Fire Force because it's not a very long show. Um, 
but I have a lot of friends that are into anime and I like during this pandemic that that has been my like these stories are amazing because they're silly um, but they also sometimes have really good messages um, they have a bunch of heroes journey s- stories so I'm I'm enjoying fire force right now that's great and also just the final point on that too is when you have a hero's journey sense of showcasing you, that yes it's it's an old formula that's been used for yeah. decades and almost century at this point but you kind of think to yourself why do you think it always works because people have the same elements of that reality in their lives yeah yeah they want to be you want to be the hero you want to conquer everything that comes your way it's uh, it's so good Definitely. And my final question to you is, what is the biggest change you want to see for yourself? The biggest change I would love to see for myself. Professionally, personally, in general, overall. It, however, what, and, and again, kind of the first thing that comes to mind, like what's the first thing you feel like should be your biggest aspect of change? Biggest aspect of change is my perspective. And I hope that changes. Um, there's a quote and gosh, I forget who said it, um, but set a goal so high that you have to grow into the person who can achieve it. Right. I want my perspective to change where I can see a bigger picture than what we're currently seeing. It's really easy to get in the weeds with theater. And I would love for my perspective to change so I can see um, the bigger picture and how I can really be most impactful on what I'm doing. That's great. And nonetheless, after such an insightful interview and a comeback episode for the Change of Him podcast, this does conclude for this episode. However, though, if you want to check out the Change of Him podcast, as we have many more episodes in the works, you can check us out on Anchor, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Autumn, thank you very much for joining me today and have a great rest of your day. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. Bye-bye.